Thank you for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Bree Hogue and I'm the store manager of Powell City of Books here in Portland, Oregon. You can check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events at powells.com. We also post information on our social media, so follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Today we are thrilled to welcome Jeff Vandermeer and Karen Russell. Jeff Vandermeer, called the Weird Thoreau by the New Yorker, once wrote a little book called Annihilation with a tower tunnel in it that became a bestseller and a movie. His work documenting the dystopian adventures of giant flying bears, talking plants, and blue foxes in Born, the Strange Bird, and Dead Astronauts has astonishingly left him with an ever more loyal readership. Although his work has won the Shirley Jackson and Nebula Awards, Vandermeer is most proud of having once helped a huge stamping turtle across a busy highway in a thunderstorm while it crapped all over him. His new novel, Hummingbird Salamander, about which he will speak tonight, performs the astonishing feat of existing in the past, the present, and our immediate future. It also has a lot of hummingbirds and salamanders in it. When not writing about climate crisis and environmental issues, Jeff can be found in his backyard in Tallahassee, Florida, talking to box turtles and employing his legion of squirrel farmers to help him weed out the butterfly garden. If you don't follow Jeff on Twitter, you may not know that he has spent the last three years making his yard into a wildlife sanctuary or that he has a charismatic cat named Neo. Vandermeer is also deeply involved in political and environmental issues in North Florida, including doing his part to oust a sitting county commissioner with an editorial and investigation about developer dark money being poured into campaigns. He currently serves on the board of the Apolicola River Keepers, I hope I said that right, and is involved in a progressive nonprofit and writes a monthly wild Tallahassee column for the local paper. If you have questions tonight for Jeff or Karen, please submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, screen there. If you want to talk with them or just leave a general comment, please leave that in the chat. You'll also notice that I put a link for a special uh, website um, in honor of the new book in the chat, including the password for that website. That's up at the top of the chat, so be sure you do scroll up to read that. Um, today, we are here to talk about Hummingbird Salamander, which is Vandermeer at his brilliant cinematic best, wrapping profound questions about climate change, identity, and the world we live into a tightly plotted thriller full of unexpected twists and elaborate conspiracy. Software manager Jane Smith receives an envelope containing a list of animals, along with a key to a storage unit that holds a taxidermied hummingbird and salamander. The list is signed love Sylvina. I'm going to leave it there with that description of the book and we're going to jump right in with Jeff and Karen. Uh, you can purchase a copy of the book at powells.com and support both Jeff and Powells. Um, I'll post links to that as well. Today joining Van Der Meer in conversation is Karen Russell. Karen won the 2012 and 2018 National Magazine Award for Fiction, the New York Public Library Young Lions Award, and is the recipient of a Guggenheim and a MacArthur Fellowship. Her first novel, Swamplandia, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. She's the author of three story collections and the 2014 novella Sleep Donation, reissued in 2020 in an illustrated paperback edition from Vintage. Her most recent story collection is Orange World and Other Stories. Born and raised in Miami, Florida, she now lives here in Portland with her husband, son, and daughter. Thank you to you both for being here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Oh, Karen, I think your mute is on. <clears throat> Karen, think, I think you're muted. <laughs> you think we hadn't been thing. doing this for months and months. <laughs> Sorry, guys, that's not the suspense you want. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much hey. for that beautiful introduction, Bree. Yeah, really. Um, so this is our first meeting, and I, I do miss that third dimension, but it's such an honor to get to uh, celebrate Hummingbird Salamander with you. 
Oh, um, thanks. Yeah, I do. I do miss that too. It's 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 weird not actually being on the road and suffering all the indignities of the road, which somehow seems so wonderful now. <laughs> yeah. What what are some of the highs and lows of an ordinary book tour for you? I feel like the anonymity of a hotel room I really miss. Yeah. And actually my last book tour was in December of 2019 and I was trying to emulate the main character in Hummingbird Salamander's journey. So I booked all these very sketchy motels because I thought at the time she was going to be traveling a lot more. Sure. And so I remember one hotel in the middle of a very cold night walking in and they had actually like glued a space heater into the wall <laughs> in a way that made me not want to turn it on at all because right. I didn't really want to die in fire. <laughs> like a so. big sign, like not a fire hazard, yes. right? <laughs> Um, it's nice to know in our litigious society, you can still book a room. Still, like oh, yes. It was it was pretty eye opening about the motels of of, the, of Northern California and, and, and Oregon. Yeah. Well, that's such, that's so interesting to me. So I was really curious reading this book. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. And um, I've oh, seen this, me too. Um, you know, build, build in many places as a thriller. And I and I was wondering, it's like that old Watergate question. What did you know and when did you know it? Mm -hmm because um, the plotting is so exquisite. Oh, and I was curious a little bit about kind of what, what was maybe the first kernel of inspiration and like, mm -hmm. you know, were you just sort of throwing stones? Like what, mm -hmm. maybe what surprised you and, and how, how the research did and did not maybe make its way. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of doing the research uh, very, very early on, uh, you know, except this trip that I took on the Pacific, yeah, on, on the coast. So that by the time I write the book, whatever I remember of the research is what I figure is interesting. So I never go back to the research. So, um, and and I think- so There's like a natural filtration system that's just yes, your own. <laughs> yes, maybe just because I'm lazy, I don't know. <laughs> but um, so I, um, so in terms of the environmental stuff, it's just what I've been kind of steeped in the last 10 years. And then there was this amazing moment when we moved into a new house where we had the chance to create a whole environmental library and uh, we just happened to know Eric Schaller, the son of George Schaller, the naturalist. And Eric, for the longest time, didn't even let us know that his father was this famous naturalist. But one day he said, oh, George is getting rid of a few books from his library. Would you like them? So we inherited part of George Schaller's library when he decided to downsize. Uh, long story short, just being that all of this stuff has been in the background for a while. So the environmental material didn't really require much mm -hmm. research. And then again, because I'm, I'm lazy, the hummingbird and salamander were actually created by a biologist, Dr. Megan Smith. So, so really it was just getting around doing too much work, I think, um, is what I like to do. So I, I guess I didn't know this. Do you, do you have a, in your own drawer, a beautiful taxidermy hummingbird? No, no. I guess the closest I have to that is whatever this is. <laughs> oh, well... <laughs> I don't have any taxidermy in here. Um, I do, hold on one second. I do have this lovely uh, uh, like cocoon from a, 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 some kind of moth, like some huge moth uh, wow. that I found one day. And it reminded me of like a fairy's nest or something like, totally. like there were magical beings living in the, in the in the ravine so I've kept it all this time but it that's the closest amazing. I have to taxidermy in the office so um I was uh when I was reading this I was thinking so much about because I have been personally colonized by your proliferating worlds you oh. know I mean I have felt that myself I'm sorry very, I know for such a short person it's very uncomfortable Jeff like <laughs> I mean I'm only like five two in shoes so it's well, really you have to absorb to, all of them <laughs> You know, that's yeah, a I mean, monumental task. I appreciate you doing it, but my God, but I do. I mean, yeah, and and Ward. I mean, that's a lot. That's, oh, you yeah. know, that cast the quite flying a the giant flying psychotic bear. Yes, on a that, Wednesday. That, that a yeah, lot. you're just driving. You're, you know, that was another. Um, uh, I, I guess I, I was thinking that you are so successful. I think a lot in terms of metaphor, right? And I always think that books are sort of like a dream contagion, hmm. um, and you're really you know, the, the best books, you're, um, you're scoring a dream for somebody else's body, right? And what they do yeah. with it is always surprising. Um, That's a good way of putting it, I think. 
I, I, I was thinking a lot, you know, axolotl is not a salamander, but that's one of my favorite short stories. It's one of mine too. I figured it, I figured it's it must a great be, story. right? And so there's that beginning for people who don't know it. This is Julio Cortazar and he has axolotl. It's a super short story. You can read it at, mm -hmm. you know, 15 minutes. And then it, like Jeff's books will always stay with you. So, you know, read it at your peril, but- <laughs> For better or worse. There, <laughs> there was a time when I thought a great deal about the axolotls. I went to see them in the aquarium at the Jardín des Plantes and stayed for hours watching them, observing their immobility, their faint movements. Now I am an axolotl. Um, and I've always thought something about the flatness of that delivery system and then just the miracle of, you know, um, that kind of point of view shift. Yeah. And suddenly you're on the other side of the glass. So much of, of what was compelling to me about this character who we only ever know by her mm -hmm. alias, Jane Smith. So I was also thinking about Ishmael where like the first, oh, right, name, yeah, you know, he's me. like, call me Ishmael. <laughs> and all you really know is like, what? <laughs> Who's this guy whose name is definitely not Ishmael? <laughs> and it establishes such a weird kind of detachment. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just presume you know much more about this character than we'll ever get to. But I don't in a sense and that I don't know her real name and I resisted trying to know it. It's kind of the same thing as when I wrote The Biologist for Annihilation. Every time I mm -hmm. tried to put the true name down, just as like, I thought maybe I needed to know it on the, on the you know, myself, uh, it, 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 it seemed to be taking me further away from the character. So it was like, I, oh, I think I need to respect what the character is telling me, even though obviously I came up with the character. Um, but I think it's it's true what you say is that about her becoming the axiotl is actually I mean I know you didn't mean that literally but but she does kind of go through this looking glass and yeah. you could say she becomes the the agent of this dead woman or the embodiment mm -hmm. in a way because she's mm -hmm. going on this journey or this this quest within this thriller structure to to kind of like I think she doesn't just want to find out the mystery she wants to kind of like enable whatever Sylvina was doing, if it was something beneficial. <laughs> yes. And I, I mean, that is something, that particular seduction of maybe putting your living arms through these empty sleeves. Uh, oh God, that accepting... reminds me of Santa Sangre for some reason. <laughs> right. But I, I, mean, I felt it. I, and I was like, oh God, like I am, um, I think you so successfully put the reader in this position mm. where you understand what would be alluring about mm. leaving mm -hmm. your suburban life behind and giving yourself over to this sort of cause. Um, and I, I uh, you know, I think also um, that that's so interesting to me that you you have this respect for what is irreducibly mysterious about Jane, that there is some part of her that well, even you, the author, don't totally pretend well, to understand. Yeah, that, and, and I think that, I mean, there's, there's certainly things I know that the reader doesn't, I guess, but but I do think I wanted to respect the position from which Jane was telling the story, which is to say, without giving too much away, she's telling the story from further along. It's not like mm -hmm. she's, you know, doing it as she goes along. And so she's kind of, she's kind of haunting the narrative with the future, yeah. you know, which is why I use the second person voice at times to kind of like engage and involve the, implicate the reader in that. Mm -hmm. um, and then to layer in things that haven't really happened yet in the narrative which is where Jane herself begins to kind of like destabilize the thriller structure. Like I felt like her very interiority was going to kind of contaminate the plot structure. So in, in an interesting way, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, so, so I had well, a lot of fun with that, I guess. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I've read about this book. Um, I didn't, I confess, I didn't do too much research because mm -hmm. speaking of contamination I was like I want my questions to be real <laughs> questions right no I and understand that's the weird thing about the internet you can yeah. start to know things about people in italics that you know and and what you're really saying is yeah. can you activate this knowledge and not can you answer no, and, my and, real question no and also I have to be honest I feel a bit of pressure to give real answers because when you sent me that email about how you like the novel I I was like I want to make sure I don't give any canned responses so I'm trying very hard <laughs> <laughs> not to give the same answers as every, every other time. Yeah, that can, I know. I, I it, And it's tricky, right? That's a special yeah. kind of plagiarism when you're on the book tour and you're like, sorry, guys, I throw this weary Frisbee out to you. Right, <laughs> like, this weary Frisbee that I could have made into a football or something else, <laughs> even right. though that would have been untruthful. <laughs> Um, <laughs> an untruthful cricket bat but yeah you would have had something this is a different. trick of teaching too right of like looking into the distance as if a thought is spontaneously occurring to you and then just hitting the microwave beep on like for me it's always like a george saunders i'm like here you are like <laughs> right yeah um i well well this is a sincere question i guess which is i've heard 
people describe the writing in this book in particular as cinematic. And I, mm. I absolutely agree. And that seemed like a real, mm -hmm. I, I, I felt the pleasure in those action mm. scenes. Mm -hmm. But I think it, I think what I've always loved about your work too, is there is, um, if it's suspenseful, so much of the suspense is like the mystery of personality in these circumstances. Mm. And it gets into like the flux of consciousness in a way that a movie for me never does. And it gets at that point where like interior and exterior landscapes mm. kind of merge. Kind of merge, yeah. You know, and I was like, maybe we need a better word than cinematic because actually there's like an opacity there that you mm -hmm. shatter in your fiction. And it seems like a vital part of your project to me, oh, right? Absolutely, I, I, because I really believe, and, and I, actually I think I had a discussion at Powell's with Lydia Yuknovich about this, where she talked about how she wants her fiction to, to live in the body. And I, I yeah. want the same thing. Like, I, I don't know that, I don't know how much, speculative fiction or any kind of fiction can claim to show you the future, but I think mm -hmm. it can, like in the literal practical sense, but I think it can show you the psychological reality of things that are not your your condition. Right. And so, you know, one thing that was actually weirdly vital to that besides the, the limited use of, of kind of a limited second person voice coming in from time to time to implicate the reader was the use of sentence fragments. Because I think in a first person narrator, you still have this, this slight barrier in that case of the I, I, I all the time, mm -hmm. just very crassly put. And so eliminating that kind of eliminates the personality so that you're more in the moment. And so I, I really loved using riffing off of like the noir kind of clipped thing, but then also having this kind of richness of expression that isn't really part of the noir tradition in the middle of that. So it's kind of a hybrid style for me. It totally but. felt that way. I mean, there is like a kind of staccato that does feel when people say an eco thriller, that's I'm like, mm -hmm. oh yeah. Right, right. You know, we're we're on the case with her. Um, but I was proud of having that plot because a lot of readers are like, he's not, he's very surreal and drifty. And it's like, well, I'm 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 surreal and drifty when the character demands it, but I, I can do these other things. I just totally. I just choose well, to withhold them from you at this time. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say I was telling my husband because I, you know, I'm a big metaphor freak and like I really yeah. love language. And um, but as a reader, you know, sometimes your pleasures as a writer and a reader are not yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, or I find that, I don't know. And I, yeah, I was um, just so struck. I was like, oh my God, when someone wants to kill yeah. you, <laughs> like <laughs> it really like gives a certain velocity to, to that to the... experience. <laughs> well, I mean, I learned a lot. Uh, sometimes movies are maligned as influence, but like I learned a lot from uh, Orson Welles' Bells at Midnight, which has that amazing uh, battle sequence where you start really high and then so, and, and just pans down and down yeah. and down until it's just like, boots in the mud. And so I study things like that in film and I think, how can I translate that? So when I do do an action scene, it has that kind of immediacy, but also that kind of interesting uh, perspective. So so I, I do try to make translations from movies for things like action scenes sometimes. I was thinking about, have you seen Night of the Hunter, Jeff? You know, a long, a long, long time, time ago. ago. And I, that, I mean, I know what you're talking about. I have like a fleeting image in my head, but that's all I have. Um. There's one, uh, I was thinking maybe, maybe it was percolating somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. who, but there, you know, he, there's sort of this adrenalized chase scene mm -hmm. and then it ends on this river and it's like so poetically mm -hmm. composed. And there's just like moonlight on spider webs mm -hmm. and frogs mm -hmm. coursing and this one little girl's yeah. pure voice singing. And it's yes. not at all what you're expecting yes. as like a declension. Yeah. And I felt like there were, the pacing of this book was just super interesting to me because mm. there would be these heart stopping moments yeah. of dread and just also like surrealist nightmare mm. deja, primordial deja vu. And then there'd be a period of sort of like, we're in the chrysalis with this woman and we are watching <laughs> her go from being, I mean, maybe, maybe a few standard deviations away from normal, right? Like if you mm -hmm. met, she's a very, I love the physical descriptions of her. Mm. She's for people who haven't read this yet. Um, is she six four? She's six two. She's six two, yeah. And, and a um former kind wrestler. Of like a, yeah. And a gym rat who who just has is kind of a broad shouldered. At one point I learned this fact that she actually talks about herself, which is that bears go around injured all the time because that's just their lifestyle. Their lifestyle is such that they're so physical that they're always semi-injured, and that's just the state of being a bear. And Jane says that about herself, that her gym routine, and everything else, that there's always some strain, not, you know, a muscle pull necessarily, but there's always, and I thought that that was really kind of interesting way of thinking about how someone carries themselves and what their body feels like to them. Yeah, uh, when I they're love doing that. It. How they would inhabit that kind of yeah. physicality. 
which actually she's, makes sense later in the book when when things really get real, <laughs> you know, that that she can carry that. <laughs> oh, totally. So. Well, I will say part of the horror, there's so much hope and horror in this for me and this idea of this mm-hmm. kind of transformation. And part of what was a little frightening to me, Sylvina, who is this very charismatic, I mean, some probably would regard her like as a cult leader. She's an, she's an right. eco-terrorist. She's a former heiress who has now, uh, she has like um, this like sort of utopian vision of what our world could become, um, whatever comes after kind of our Anthropocene and, and its damage. Um, and p- but part of her project seems to be remaking what it means to be a human being mm-hmm. and the way that we're oriented towards nature. And I think you do this so beautifully in the Southern Reach trilogy too, but what was so striking to me with Jane, I mean, she becomes an entirely different creature over the course of this book. Mm-hmm. And it's, it is not only positive. Like, I mean, I think you could really argue that it's, yeah. there's something horrifying about it. And um, at a certain point she loses her desire really, it seems to contact her, her, her life yeah. kind of shrinks uh, into some yeah, sort of and, vestigial and, and, deal. And she finds, I mean, and she says things like, you know, I thought I needed the office socialization because, you know, she's in a, working in an office as a security uh, expert or consultant at first, and she has to negotiate that landscape. And, and uh, it feels like that that's something that's part of her life. But then when it's gone, she realizes she never really needed it or wanted it. So it's, she, it is yeah. true that as the novel progresses, there's, there's more and more kind of like society without, you know, being a th- Theodore Dresser novel that kind of are stripped away from her. Um, yeah. And, and then what replaces that is, 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 is basically having to deal with her past, but also, you know, when, when this stuff gets stripped away, I think Sylvina comes to mean even more to her. Mm-hmm. And she also is more paranoid. And, and that's something that I wanted to talk about in the novel, because, I think we all now live with a certain amount of paranoia that's healthy uh, to just discern what's BS and what's true in the world, right? The way that disinformation comes mm-hmm. to us. So it's like, where's the balance and uh, what happens when you lose that? So, so I do see, you talk about hallucinogenic in a way. I do see that, that the interiority of Jane after the midpoint of the novel does become more surreal because I feel like she's more in her own head. And, you know, that was a lot of, I think we've all experienced that during the pandemic. Like, like I've had conversations with the neighbors in my head and then <laughs> almost had to pull back from the brink of thinking I actually had those conversations and the neighbors have the viewpoints that I was grumbling about. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like, because yeah. you, you just get too much in your own head. And so I wanted to explore that as well. Yeah. And then at the same time, it seems like, you know, the, as that boundary becomes, a face between Jane and sort of this landscape she's traveling. There was real hope in that for me too, even though I was thinking one of the things this book does so well is remind you at every turn that a transformation is violent. It's not, mm, it's not, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like a transformation requires an extinction of a kind. So I guess I, this is, I'm not even sure how to ask this question, Jeff. And I see like, we, I don't want to take up all the time either. I could talk to you oh, I no, think for hours not. about this. But um, I, when you think, as you write these books, which feel mm-hmm. like experiments to me, they yes, really absolutely. push me right to the frontier of what I can imagine. Like the language is really, I feel like directing me towards some wordless place. Mm. And, and I love that about your writing. And I wondered a little bit without getting too like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, metaphysical, woo woo. Mm-hmm. I don't like, I, I feel the danger that I'm gonna teeter into like total incoherence. But I wondered yeah. like, as you're writing these yourself, do you start to sort of approach like a different understanding, like a different way that we could be in relationship to yeah, non-human I would, nature? I would say so. And it, it, I do inhabit these characters very deeply. And I, I, I use a lot of what I would call method acting techniques to kind of do that, you know, because mm-hmm. just the very simplest one is simply that I, I will go around my day trying to pretend to be in character and do the simplest things from the character's point of view and try to see the world through that, that mm-hmm. character's point of view. Uh, and then when the when things get intense in a novel, I am so focused in on it. I, I write longhand and am not encumbered by any technology other than the technology of a pen and a piece of paper. <laughs> uh, in a way that that I think, um, for me at least, gets to, gets me into this kind of reverie or this 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 altered state when I'm writing some of these kinds of scenes. Um, so I think. I think definitely. And then, and then there's just sneaky bits of craft, like, you know, Jane's awareness of the environment happens to dovetail with the fact that she's in more and more rural areas. So I don't even need to like 
punctuated. It's just simply that's what her surroundings are. Um, it's it's like the novel itself is reflecting her her point of view changing mm -hmm. without me having to do any work. Um, but uh, but it is a laboratory. It's like there are views and, and points of view in the book that I don't share, but I think are important to to put into a piece of fiction if you're going to discuss the climate crisis and things like that. And I don't mean discuss in a didactic way, but explore. Right. Um, I did find myself wondering a lot, and I have no answers mm -hmm. to any of these questions, but about what kinds of compromises do you make in the pursuit of a goal like this one? Mm -hmm. And what is that line between activism and terrorism? Like, where do you start to... Um, yeah, I mean, and you see it in the world itself, because, you know, what does a, a indigenous tribe in the Amazon do if miners with guns come and try to take their property and the government won't do anything about it? Or mm -hmm. what do we do about the fact that you can't, in some states now, take photographs uh, of uh, factory farms uh, and the horrors that they're up to without going to jail for 10 years. So there's like a sliding scale just in terms of what activism can be. So that, that's what I wanted to put out there. But I also found it fascinating in terms of thinking about Sylvina as someone who came from a very rich, privileged background right. uh, and, and what that would do to how you think of what the solution might be. Right. You know, and would that also kind of contaminate things the same same way that Unitopia, the, the commune she tries to set up becomes kind of kind of contaminated. And you were talking about cults and I really did see it that way because I, mm -hmm. I started like going into doing research that I didn't even need for, for like utopian communes from the 60s and 70s. And it felt like the founders always were the problem. Like they <laughs> had the vision, but they had a built-in flaw of some kind that always brought the thing down in the end or something horrible happened because the human element of their personality that helped was also the thing that, that destroyed it, you know? Oh so. God, it's really <laughs> almost embarrassing sometimes to watch these cult documentaries, right? Yeah. Cause they just cue to such a template. You're like, oh boy, yeah. you're just like <laughs> ride the wave of like sincere goodwill, right? Like, yeah, I think, yeah. you know, beautiful ideals. And it's like, but here comes the sex party or whatever. Right, or exactly. <laughs> So I thought that would be interesting. I thought it'd be interesting also to have antagonists, mostly who are men, who are very melodramatic and very emotional. Oh, I love <laughs> In that. Contrast I mean, not to, to Jan, give anything Jane, away, Jane, but I definitely that was very this interesting, is, but. yeah, talk to, I mean, there's like, <laughs> I think it can almost sound so petty, right? But like some people are definitely driven by romantic jealousies, right? And you're like, right, oh, is right, that right. part of what has like slingshotted you across the country? Right, and so I thought it would be kind of, well, not funny, but like darkly as an absurdist, I thought it would be funny that, that this whole that there would be things that 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 came down to like these most kind of inane human moments. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I yeah. don't know, because um, it's unavoidably so what human happens. moments. And we see right. it in the news every day. But totally um, <laughs> like the same kind of charisma that would draw people to Unitopia yeah. is maybe going to just, you know, create some right, turbulence right. once you're there at this <laughs> Well, I don't, I, I wonder if you could read a little bit to us so people kind of get a flavor of the book. Yeah, sure. And um, I have to remember right after the reading to announce the the winners of various um, posters and whatnot. I'll hold them up uh, kind of crassly. I feel like so we can can't win, right? It's like when you're the, the kid whose birthday it is, you can't win the prizes. You can win, Karen. <laughs> I can send you all the prizes. <laughs> I think you deserve all the prizes. So I thought I'd read just two pages of the stuff that isn't a bunch of um, fights and chases and everything else. Um, and everyone's like, oh, I'm disappointed. He's gonna read about flowers. Um, so I'm gonna read a part uh, that is actually, uh, part of it, the, the part of the quotes are actually by Dr. Megan Brown because it turned out when she gave me the hummingbird and salamander descriptions and life cycle, the wording was so perfect that I hadn't anticipated this that I would actually, use it all. So, so some of those quotes are actually her words, but at a certain point, Jane uh, has done enough research that she knows the life cycle of the hummingbird. And it's also the thing that kind of gets her involved in the mystery, I think, because she feels like it's emotionally attached to Sylvina. So she wants it to be emotionally attached to her. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a section that's basically all about facts about an imaginary hummingbird. So probably not as typical of the novel as something else I could read, but <laughs> right. I'm trying to read a different piece every night. So Oh, the flowers, Sylvina, the flowers and all of it. Videos entranced me, watched on a burner phone from the go bag I didn't realize would have other uses. This creature was everything I was not. We could not be more dissimilar, and yet inside, 
I felt a welling up of sympathy for the toughness, for the miracle of this creature. Was this a gift Sylvina gave me too? How the world opened up, how it kept opening up? The hummingbird went into a kind of suspended animation or micro hibernation each night due to the high number of calories it needed. Torpor was a word I'd never considered, as in torpor, decreases their metabolism by 90%, their heart rate by 15 times and their body temperature from over 100 degrees Fahrenheit to the ambient temperature. They ran hot, so very hot, but then got so cold, like icy jewels there in the mountain, clinging to a branch, hidden by foliage, dreaming of what? Did they dream of anything? They died, in a sense, every time, and the sun resurrected them. The nectar was life. Miraculous, and as I learned more and loved them more, I loved Sylvina more and more. What I felt must have been what she felt, although how could I know? The flowers, too, the flowers, the words connecting hummingbirds to blossoms that I hadn't known, like nectariverous. <laughs> Larkspur, columbine, fireweed, the small tank, the high burn, all of this new information lit tiny fires inside. I took such delight, and delight didn't come easy to me but it did here. They feasted on a particular kind of flower in the Shizanthus genus, commonly called poor man's orchid, or in Spanish, Maripostia, that occupy stream valleys at mid elevation in the Andes. These flowers contained powerful alkaloids, hallucinogenic to humans, and had affected so much of the bird's evolution. Remarkable details. Their very head shape had adapted to quote, better carry pollen between immobile flowers, and in turn the flower cups have adapted to fit the hummingbird's bill. Singing, dancing, beauty competitions, how to pro process this ethereal touch, this intel so at odds with my job and my life. Hadn't the hummingbird been a kind of miracle? Hadn't it diminished us not to see this as a miracle and protect it? so beautiful you know we i didn't really have hummingbirds in where we grew up in miami but here mm -hmm. in the pacific northwest we have tons and one of the gifts of being home is that you get really on very intimate terms with your own mm -hmm. backyard right oh yes yes absolutely <laughs> and um i love that description because there's something about that particular iridescence i feel like it's as close as i'll ever come personally to seeing mm -hmm. into the ultraviolet mm -hmm. You know, and they're so um, they're so nosy, like they'll keep their distance, but at least here they they'll come right up to like if I'm using the hose on the garden, they'll come right up to the stream or they'll come right up onto the they'll, they'll kind of levitate from down below where I don't see them. And suddenly they'll be at eye level on the upper deck, just staring right at me, you know, and then yeah. just kind of just right. There, right? Yeah, it's just right. I mean, so I find them really quite fascinating for that that reason, too. And they, they don't act the same as other birds. But. No, no. And um, right, they're sort of like the orchid of birds or something, right? Yes, Where you're like, the orchid of birds. Is this flower <laughs> sentient? <laughs> <laughs> and moving all over the place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there is something about this taxidermy bird that felt to me like a syllable, you know, like some er syllable or something in, inside this book. And the vertigo that you capture so well of discovering something that might be extinct, right? Yes. Sort of holding in your hand yes. a miracle that you that you failed entirely to yes. appreciate while it was with us and alive. And, and, um, and I chose that. I chose the hummingbird for the long migration, obviously, and the salamander for the porousness of the skin, which are two things that I think are very relevant in terms of our climate crisis moment. But I also chose them because there are still real hummingbirds and salamanders that are alive in the world that we need to protect. I didn't want to choose an animal that was completely extinct in, in all possible phases, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, because that's where the hope lies, is that there are real live hummingbirds and salamanders out there right now that need our help. I you know, and, and I, we need our help. They need, yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like helping them helps us. I, I just I, want to say I that. I think that's you know, the, so. you know, that metaphor. Could you talk a little bit about that? Just the, the salamander, because that to mm. me, if there's yes. hope for us, I think it lies right there in that sort of um, mutuality. But yeah, um, yeah, no, the, the, well, I mean, the axial has the same quality because it's kind of in the same, the, this, this idea of the porousness of the skin and, and even in dead astronauts, I was kind of talking about salamanders as well. And I'm just fascinated by the idea of a creature that so immediately receives the harm of the world mm -hmm. through its entire body uh, and what that means. And, and, and also the fact that we also receive that harm. It's just 
delayed to the point that we can kind of live with the fact we have like 40% cancer rates in some places, right. right? It's like the same thing is happening to us. It's just, it's not happening so overwhelmingly at the, in the immediate moment that, that, that we register it as quite the same emergency. Right. And so I thought that was interesting. And then I really thought since the hummingbird came first and was like the first love of, of Jane in terms of this wildlife idea, that the salamander really needs to be placed in a position where just the entry itself and the discussion of this quality of it mm -hmm. would have some kind of emotional resonance with regard to the character situation. So I think I found a place fairly late in the novel where the entry itself is imbued with emotion that the reader brings in because of Jane's situation. Um, and I thought that was an interesting effect as well. So um, they're, very, they're deployed very differently in how I use the information, I think. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that Flannery O'Connor line, you know, where people ask her if the wooden leg is a symbol. And she said, if you want it to be a symbol, fine. But it has a literal life in the plot. But it has a literal story, life you know? too, exactly. It has to have a literal life first. Um, and that for me is key. It has to have the physicality. It can stand for anything later. But, but I do have a problem sometimes with novels where I feel like the writer, you know, and this doesn't apply all the time, where the writer is creating metaphor first out of something. Right. Um, and not clothing it properly in my my estimation. <laughs> um, right. Although I'm sure I'm guilty of the same thing from time to time. Um, but yeah, I, and I appreciate Karen, your, your close reading of this novel. I really, I, I can't tell you how much that, that really means to me um, that you understood this novel so well it is really important to me. So, um, and so, so we don't get any more modeling than that. I'll announce the winners of the contest right now. <laughs> So we can move on to a different emotional beat, but um, <laughs> there's a there's there is this commune called Unitopia, and uh, Jeremy Zerfoss did these amazing posters that took the blueprint of Unitopia that's in the book and did like a psychedelic art version of them. So we're giving those away, wow. uh, as well as this hummingbird salamander uh, stationery wow. <laughs> and a T-shirt with a, a design on it. So the winners are, and all you have to do to collect, and I'll put it in the 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 thing here too, is. Um, just go to my uh, jeffvandermeer.com website and fill out the contact form, and that's how you can contact me. So Jen Blair, Hannah Richter, and Lauren Lease are the winners. That's Jen Blair, Hannah Richter, and Lauren Lease. And I will type that also uh, into the uh, into the comments field in the, the chat. Right. So sorry for sorry for that small disruption, but. Anyway, I love to imagine these people. About? <laughs> <laughs> now, Jeff, now they're going to use that stationery to will a terrible, annihilating <laughs> opportunity to someone. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I was thinking a little bit. I, I mean, I really fell under her spell, too. Uh, mm -hmm. And you mentioned that some, you know, you agree with some things in this book, you mm -hmm. don't agree with others. And there were moments where I have to admit, I broke a little bit, right? And I, right. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, keep on jogging there. I'm going to have to fall back now. But I, there is this gorgeous part, you know, um, Sylvina wrote that even through the poison lands, even though, yeah, I'm sorry, here we go. Yeah. yeah. So she's talking about that almost like a pantheistic kind of vibrancy mm -hmm. to this world, right? Or this mm -hmm. vitality that, that is, is yes. almost overwhelming because it yeah. unifies all life here. Um, and I really, it, like it put me in touch with that life wish that I think mm -hmm. is what we really need right now. Once you saw it all, you could never go back. Everything was alive, overwhelming. I was overwhelmed eventually, mm -hmm. overcome. Sylvina wrote that even though the poison landscape through, I, why can't I say that word? I'm sorry. We must <laughs> okay. love it. We must love what has been damaged because everything has been damaged. And to love the damage is to know that you care about that world, that you're still in the fight. And I, you know, that's like, oh. I felt like that was exactly what I needed to read at this stage in our pandemic and these sort of overlapping crises. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, th this is actually very autobiographical because before we moved to this new house three years ago, I didn't know anything about native plants. Landscapes were animals and birds. <laughs> And um, and I, I feel really guilty and weird that it took till I was almost 50 to <laughs> appreciate that. But oh but uh, also living in this ravine where we are in a suburban neighborhood, it's just that there are these small ravines in Tallahassee that are wooded because they're too steep to build on the houses all around. So they're these amazing islands of biodiversity. Like we're mm -hmm. 10 minutes from the capital and yet we have all this wildlife in our yard. 
Um, but we also, like the other day, I found a rusty figure skate that must have been down there for 30 years. I found a <laughs> small barrel of something that I don't know what it was that I had to take out. You know, there's been a lot of contamination of this area too. And so I have to kind of live with the idea that I can rewild this to an extent, but there still is all this damage. You know, there's mm -hmm. fertilizer that's going to come down from, from, you know, when it rains down the slope for those who use it. So a couple people, you know, around the edge of this use herbicide and whatnot. So there's damage coming as as well as as restoration and and so that really came from the heart for me uh so there were parts of sylvina's uh screeds that that were really for me and then there were ones that weren't <laughs> very much not for me but i thought it was interesting to kind of like put them in that context so totally and it does i reading this i was like this is like a wide-scale counterfactual it really read like mm -hmm. a laboratory or an experiment to mm -hmm. me and the yeah. whole idea of rewilding, if I'm correct, right? It's mm -hmm. you're just reintroducing, you're returning to like the nature's yeah. logic. Right. Yeah. I mean, native species is, is always referring to um, pre-settler indigenous species. And that also usually ties in to the fact that those a lot of those plants tied into indigenous land management. So like here, there's a lot of plants that were uh, invasive and I won't go on very long because I could forever because I've become <laughs> that person. Um, but basically, we had to pull out a lot of plants that you buy at big box stores because that are from other places that take over and they don't allow the native seed bank to, mm -hmm. to come up. And so they just smother everything. And then the wildlife has no food to eat because they're not adapted. You know, the insects aren't adapted to eat or host off of these other plants. So that's all we've done is we've basically just allowed the native seed bank to come back, planted natives and taken out these others. And I mean, our trail cam now, and this is the way it's supposed to be. Some people are horrified when they see this. On the trail cam, it's now triggered in the spring because there are so many moths, it's like a snowstorm. <laughs> and that's really the way it's supposed to be. Some people don't like that, but it's totally benign insects. It's not like it's a swarm of mosquitoes. Right. Um, but when I saw that for the first time, I just was like, wow, they have what they need, you know? And then of course, something came along and ate all the moths, which is the way it's supposed to be because there's supposed to be food for other things too, so. Yeah, my kids are just starting to grapple with that. You know, my son oh. said to me, he's like, Mom, one day a shark will eat me, but it's okay. It's the circle of life. Like, well, that's <laughs> that's very philosophical for how old? He's four. Oh. He's, he's excited. <laughs> he's, he's, he's like, don't so worry. Cute. That's then he so also cute. told me, I think he's really into cycles right now. You know, he was like, I'll come back in the spring from the dead with cookies. And I was like, this is like such a gentle Stephen King story, you know? You must use some <laughs> of this stuff. I mean, I know Erin, my stepdaughter, when uh, the thing she would say, like she would see a ferret and she didn't know what a ferret was. So she'd point at it and say long mouse. And I'm like, that's Isn't going that in something. <laughs> totally. When he was a little younger, he said the squirrels were, were miniature bears. He thought the yeah. trees were just full of tiny bears. <laughs> Because they see without our categories, right? And then yes, I thought exactly. Ward needs to know that his <laughs> his minions are just populating all the trees in the Northwest. Um, you know, we had this these terrible fires here um, I know, not I too know. long ago. And I there, I mean, there's been extreme weather in Florida too, I know. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if that's exactly the locus for hope, but I did feel like, you know, the bill has come due now. It's not mm -hmm. like we're waiting, right? People right, were climate right. refugees in Oregon. There was a pandemic right. and there were fires throughout the state. And I mean, it was the kind of thing where it was like your salamander. I mean, we couldn't yeah. breathe in our houses. Yeah. And so it's just, I don't know if I'm hope, I cautiously wish, I, I think that we're developing some sense, right? That like, this isn't, um, we can't, we can't, I don't think we can acclimate to it forever. I mean, no. I, I, I feel the thing that we acclimate to that's so sad is that each generation acclimates to the idea of there being fewer animals in the world and fewer right. birds and feel like it's always that way. And then our, even like our historical films become a fiction, you know, things about the quote unquote new world. And there's like almost no animals in the frame because they couldn't possibly find enough animals to replicate what it was like back then. Yeah. Um, but I, I do have, I do have hope because also I think there's a new generation that really gets it, that, that oh, yeah. understands that the systems really have to change that, that yes, we have individual responsibility to do what we can as well, but the systems themselves have to change, have to um, change in, in a really profound way, in a very yeah. profound way. Uh, and I, I, the only thing that, that I, I hope people do, and I, and I said this at the beginning is I do see green tech being delinked from bios from the biosphere and this idea that if we just do solar, that we'll be okay. And I don't think that's true, especially when they're like cutting down forests to put in solar panels in Florida, which is just nuts. 
Oh my you know, God. Well, fa- so, we were you know, talking it, we a little bit about the both. folly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very weird. So I think it's really hard to imagine our present economic system. You know, it's yeah. really hard for me to think. I, I, I was listening to Elizabeth Colbert speaking mm-hmm. on this. Oh, right. Yeah. And her I, own yeah. kind of cynicism about some of this green tech stuff where she's like, are we really going to decouple mm. growth from resources? Yes. That's what we're not doing yet. And we have to. Yeah. So, well, so I think your suspicion is founded. I, oh, I see that we have some questions piling oh. up. <laughs> maybe the, maybe the answers are in this Q, in the A part of the Q&A. Let's, okay. let's open it up and see. Okay. Open up the magic box of perils yeah. <laughs> and wonders. <laughs> They're like, Jeff, what is your pin number that you always use? <laughs> I'm going to put my pin number in the, in the chat room right now. Um, yeah, there, well, there's we my were pin talking number. about a little bit. Has technology enabled us to care less to accelerate the fatal adaptation? Um, I, I think that it distracts us sometimes. Um, I think the again that this issue of there being tech solutions uh, is that the, that was the question, right? Okay, mm-hmm. so um, and and I not to to pile on Elon Musk because I always do, but it's a classic example of the wrong person uh, for the moment because here's somebody who's chosen a, a SpaceX site or whatever that, that that's really harming the environment and now wants to actually mine that area to provide fuel for his rockets and is saying stuff like, oh, fossil fuels aren't that bad yeah. and also doesn't like unions. So, you know, we could have had a good car battery without all of that, I think. <laughs> um, so it's the same thing we were talking about before with Unitopia and communes and everything else. Um, so I think that's part of it is we need to stop, uh, we need to have the right people in place doing these things to some degree. So we don't have to like indenture our children to the star guild or. <laughs> right. I don't want to indenture my children to the star guild. I don't think that they really want that. Um, I also think probably the patches you have to wear on your arm and stuff are, are pretty tacky. So tacky. Uh, for the star guild. So many um, epaulets. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to be in the space force either, whatever the heck that crap is. <laughs> um. Here's a great question, I think, that I was wondering too. Do you foresee more books in the Hummingbird Salamander universe? You know, I, I don't I don't think so. Uh, it feels like a standalone, but on the other hand, the uh, the build for build up to this in terms of PR, I, I always kind of bridled it just doing the normal things. I like to do something that's maybe a little more visual. So Jeremy Zerfoss, who I've collaborated with a lot, did a lot of like found objects and artifacts for like the Friends of Sylvina. Um, like brochures and pamphlets they might have <laughs> handed out. A friend, uh, Ali Spir- Sperling, actually put that psychedelic poster up in Berlin and took photos. So there's now a site called Friends of Sylvina that I'll put the thing up. Uh, let's just friendsofsylvina.com oh, that has all these cool. like found objects that are like a continuation of the story um, that will make absolutely zero sense <laughs> unless you've read the book. So at this point, it's like we went from doing some little objects that like are promoting the book to things that are so esoteric that they can't possibly sell any books. So I don't know, maybe it got out of control. <laughs> it's the old Tolkien trajectory, right? <laughs> oh God, like, no, there's no Tom Bombadil. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. Let's see. Um. Do you feel that the publishing industry itself needs to move more towards a neutral effect in creating physical books, both in how paper is sourced and the process and inks used? Oh, that's interesting. I think they are. I mean, I, I think that, yeah. that a lot of publishers are using recycled papers. And then, you know, if you, the, the truth is that if you are managing actual wood that's supposed to be harvested, not old growth forest, that, that you can do that to some extent sustainably, but it's a good question overall. I mean, every aspect of our lives is full of waste uh, and things that we could be doing more efficiently and with less harm. Uh, so, so yeah, of course. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure there's lots of rooms for improvement there too. Yeah, that's it. I, it's been humbling during this pandemic to really reckon every day with like the landfill that children mm. create. Mm. It's shocking. I mean, it's really, it's really children. upsetting actually. It's like, who knew? Uh, who knew? So many indigestible <laughs> plastic, like Fisher Price pyre. Oh you know? God! Um, that's not what you want to survive. You. No. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Florida. I feel so. Um, Patrick yes. asks Jeff, you draw on Florida ecologies to paint the surreal and destroying environments in Southern Reach. Can you talk a bit about Florida? 
Hmm. What do you find so compelling or strange, disturbing, dark, wonderful, foreboding, weird about its ecosystems? Well, I mean, first of all, when I wrote uh, Annihilation, I didn't realize that I, in some cases, that I was writing scenes that hor were horrific. <laughs> like, it's just Florida, right? It's just right. like, you you're know, like, it's it's alligators. Just, I know, I had this too, right? Where you're like, it's just Wednesday when people are like, <laughs> it's just this Wednesday. What the? I mean, yeah, sure. Maybe the dolphin ha didn't have a human eye when I saw it in a freshwater canal, but <laughs> but I saw a dolphin in a freshwater canal. You know, it's like it's not yeah. an unusual thing. Um, so so I was just disoriented sometimes by how thoroughly people thought that the the nature was dark in 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 that book. But you know, one thing I would say is that you know I really push back against people who say that there is no wilderness anymore. And I know everything has been touched to some degree, but North Florida is one of the most biodiverse places in the world. Uh, has tons of biodiversity and, and carbon sinks that are worth fighting for uh, that shouldn't be developed, uh, tons of national and state parks and, and uh, is, is just so rich. And there are a lot of places like that still, despite how much we've lost. And, and so that's one reason that I like Florida, even though developers are trying to totally destroy it. And, and we don't have, we have a signature animal like the Florida panther, but we do not have like a signature tree like the redwoods in, in California. And yet our palmettos, some of them that are being destroyed right now that kind of lurk across the ground are 10,000 years old. And they're just being, you know, dug up for building crappy houses that cost too much. Um, but because they're not this majestic thing, nobody realizes just how old they are or how amazing or how much life they support. So, you know, that's one thing that's one of my goals in the kind of non-fictional realm and, and the advocacy realm is to try to make those things that seem invisible visible make it clear what the cost is when you clear an acre of land and you know i'm all for like affordable housing and whatnot which is a totally different thing but this is not what this is this is just building out of greed and cutting corners so that they can make as much money as humanly possible when they could do it more sustainably my um my Sorry, brother's my uh, no i love that <laughs> rant because it's that is the folly of florida right yeah. i feel like um my brother was reporting on Miami Beach where they're trying to mitigate uh, the effects of climate change with property taxes. They're funding their, <laughs> like, and it's like, we're just doing it wrong.com, guys. Yeah, and, and building <laughs> pumps, this is what cracks me up. They're building pumps that by the time they finish them, like a year after they finish them, they will no longer have the capacity to actually pump enough water out because of the rising sea level. So it's like, it feels like the a job. Book, right? It <laughs> feels engineering like a job. Yeah, like a... Right? <laughs> it's like, just embarrassing yeah, it's like, guys. Well, we need to fire some people <laughs> yeah and then and then the the i guess the powerful contrast is the kind of rewilding you're talking about i mean i remember this is like some time ago now but researching swamplandia reading a lot about the kissimmee restoration project yeah yeah where it's like if you just remove some of yes. these dikes and levees yes. like yeah. the floodplain returns and there's like a hydrological yeah. i mean it's like the original logic returns. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you that. see that in um, Washington. They've done that with taking some of the, Washington State. They've taken some of their dams away and and had wonderful results. Wonderful and, and that's also the rewilding thing that I love is it's very democratic. It can be done on a very small scale. It can be don't mow your, your lawn, <laughs> leave your leaf litter alone. It literally can save you time and money. And it can be done on a small scale. You can have a balcony and you can put out wildflowers. I got a great email from a guy who lives in Atlanta and he just put out a, a bowl of, of wildflowers and he and this hummingbird on its migration came and stopped over. And who knows, that may have been the vital thing it needed to get through Atlanta, you know? So, so anything can make a difference and, and add up and, and shows us that, th that we can make a difference if that makes any sense. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah, absolutely. I am, um, uh, let's see, I don't, I, I could, I could yak forever, Jeff, know, forgive me guys. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Jeff, your ability to blend scientific information with more colorful, beautiful language is really terrific. Can you talk about your approach to passing along that info, blending the need for plot advancement, exposition, and the art of the storytelling too? <laughs> so good. Well, I mean, one thing that's important to me in the rough draft is that I have to get what's essential for the scene down first. I can layer all kinds of other things in, but if I don't get the essential thing down for the scene, mm -hmm in the rough draft, it's, it's going to be hard to achieve all those effects. So sometimes it's that I need to get the dialogue right. And it doesn't matter if everything else is crap, you know, if, if I'm having a problem conceiving the whole scene in a very rich way. Um, 
But I think that, you know, the way I do research is really important. The fact that I just do it very, very early and then forget about it uh, helps on the scientific mm -hmm. side. In this case, having the hummingbird and the salamander created by Dr. Megan Brown really helped because having to encounter that and, and deal with what she came up with and not create it myself uh, was much more of a constraint. And that by itself kind of like suggests plot or suggests other things that I might not have thought of. Um, it's, it's just a process, you know, I mean, very early on, I realized that I wanted to do very different structural works and very different characters. So I tried to, you know, just absorb as much different craft as possible by reading as many different kinds of novels and nonfiction too, as possible and poetry, uh, and just expose myself even to things that I found boring or that I didn't like, but that there was something in it that was useful. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a tough question to, to, to answer because at this point, there's a lot of like organic muscle memory going on. This is me being greedy and asking just one last question that I'm very <laughs> interested in. You're so greedy. What is I wrong? wonder since you mentioned, you know, assimilating so many different kinds of books, and this is such a hybrid monster of a book yeah. too, in a wonderful way. How important is genre to you, Jeff? Do you think going into something, mm -hmm. I conceive of this as a thriller versus I'm, I am writing a fantasy, I'm writing science fiction, or does that reveal itself to you? I think there are two, two different things. One is, um, I think in terms of, am I doing a renovation or an innovation if I'm dealing with genres or not? And so that kind of tells me what, what I'm going to be trying to, what the scenes are going to be like, even like how you're going to, how I'm going to cut the scenes or where I'm going to begin a scene in terms of what the expectations are before I start subverting stuff. Um, and then the other thing is probably, uh, is this a novel that requires a character arc resolution but not necessarily a story revolution, uh, 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 resolution. And, and that's what the Southern Reach trilogy was, um, was the character arcs need to be resolved, but the story arc can't be because of the theme of the books is something beyond, is grappling with something beyond human comprehension. So if the story resolves, I've actually failed. <laughs> and I know that for some percentage of readers, that was very frustrating, but, but that was very intentional. Um, also because I hate characters finding out things they couldn't possibly fi oh. figure out. Well, so well, that, that also yeah, determines really sometimes how I think mystery. about genre. <laughs> but here, here it made sense that there was going to be a uh, more traditional three act resolution kind of destabilized by Jane's interiority. Mm -hmm. But th then the question was just, where do I leave the story? And I, I don't want to give spoilers, but that was the issue of like how traditional this is going to be. Where am I going to leave the story? Um, and as you know, I leave it at a certain point when I could have left it at a different point. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I love where this story ends. It's, I was even preparing these questions. I was like, it's a tough book to ask questions about in a way. Cause you don't want to, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. such pleasure in the surprises yeah. here. And in some ways it is, it's such a deeply haunted family story. Also, we didn't really get to talk about that as much, but there's a like, whole other yeah. ghost story beyond Sylvina's, uh, you know, this obsessional mm -hmm. haunting quality that the hummingbird itself has. Um, the past resurfaces in such a wonderful way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, um, I, I thought it would be interesting since people sometimes are okay with backstory of a character just being there to be characterization to kind of be sneaky about that a little bit. So. I am. Um, I was thinking too, you know, just speaking of genre, uh, a friend of mine who's a sociologist is always saying people miss what's hopeful about a ghost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they do, right? I mean, they're just like, banish it, exercise it, get the, you know. <laughs> yeah, get it no, out it's of true. And actually it's, it's like the ghost here is an opportunity. It's just something yeah. to be done. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a real moral quality to it in a way. It's it's sort of the past saying, I'm not over and done with. And, yeah. and I'm going to lead you to the future, you know? <laughs> and I'm really quite, I, 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 you know, I, I really want to talk about this book like a year down the road. Um, and, and I'm really curious about how readers are going to, you know, come to that ending and what they take away from it because, um, well, I can't say, <laughs> but, but I am really going to be fascinated to be able to talk about that at some point. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that right. I'm sure we'll, we'll have a whole new context to receive right. this book in. Um, yeah. And um, and there's a lot of direct address. I felt very personally. Yes, know, yes, I, I felt very I, personal. I, um, I, I, I um, yeah. Thanks. I'm glad. I, I, I wanted. That's part of the haunting, right? It's, it's so you know. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, well, let's see. Maybe we have time for just no. Maybe we don't have time for one more question. Sure. Let's what, take no, one more question. Yeah, working on that's now, fine. But... Let's take one more question. Sure. Okay. What now? What? Uh, what project are you working on now? Um, I actually uh, wrote a long novella in the lead up to Hummingbird Salamander because my brain was like, you're supposed to be working on Hummingbird Salamander stuff. Why don't you write a long novella <laughs> that's totally unrelated <laughs> to anything? Um, and the setup, I'll just tell you briefly because I'm very proud of it, is a, a surveillance person from like the CIA or something is tasked with inhabiting this empty house and spying on the family in the house of Cross, which is identical because the same architect um, built them. And unbeknownst to him, the architect is actually living in a tunnel between the two houses. Um, and the setup, and it sounds horrific, but but it's also kind of Borgian. Um, one day his handler goes kind of nuts and goes across and kills the family he's supposed to surveil. And he's just you know, shocked and horrified. But when he wakes up in the morning, the family has returned to the oh, house and is oh. still living there. And that's just a setup. So I'm very happy with this particular piece. Oh no. <laughs> but you will not want to read it at night. Let's put it that way. So oh, that's God, what I'm working be careful on now. what you wish for when you hit reset. Oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah, sorry to ick people out. But <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you both for being here. That was such a fun and fascinating and multifaceted conversation. Um, I think everyone was really excited to be here tonight and see the two of you talk. Thanks again to Jeff for the um, contest that he held tonight. And can you say again, they're supposed to go to your website? Yeah, just go to jeffvandermeer.com and there's a contact form area and you can email me, email me through that and give me your address so we can send you the stuff. Uh, and you get to choose between the items as to which which one you'd prefer. Um, and Karen I, and and Powell's, thank you so much for hosting this. And Karen, thank you so much uh, for such a, a just an in depth exploration of this book. And 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 just it's so wonderful to talk to you. I could talk to you for hours about Florida and the Pacific Northwest. And I, oh, I would really I love, I don't want to be presumptuous. I would love to go hiking with you at some point. Yeah, it's a date. <laughs> it's a date. I think I established that I'm a hummingbird because I I was talking in a hummingbird <laughs> that, velocity. Am I the I'm salamander sorry. then? <laughs> I got so excited. <laughs> it, was a, it was a true, sincere pleasure. Thank you so much, Bree. Thank you guys for coming. And congratulations, yeah. Jeff. Everybody well, get this book. Thank it's you, Karen. Brilliant. Thank you. Perfect. All right. All right. Excellent. Take later. care. Thank Bye. you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Jeff's All new right. book is... <laughs> we'll see you later. The new book is Hummingbird Salamander. And you can buy it at powells.com. Yeah. Right. And Carol, Karen's latest book is Orange World and Other Stories and also Sleep Donation. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jeff. You have a good night. All right. Good night. Bye.